climate change pushes us along even further. This to me is the most interesting map in the world and the true vulnerability going forward. 19th century, century of chemistry gets us chemical weapons, World War I. 20th century, century of physics gets us nuclear weapons, World War II. 21st century, century of biology. You could follow the implications, but this is the most important biology, how we feed ourselves because the global middle class wants to eat much better. If you want to get rice in the system, excess rice, pretty much got to go to Asia. If you want to get sugar in the system, pretty much got to go to Brazil. If you want to get beef, it's Australia, New Zealand, in South uh, Asia here, and Argentina, Brazil, Chile over here. If you want to get dairy, the Saudi Arabia of milk is New Zealand. We've all seen the movies, Lord of the Rings. It's a very wet place. <laughs> That'll be the theme here. The Western Hemisphere provides the vast majority of excess movable feasts that allows for caloric intake to rise, overwhelmingly. Soybeans and pork to Asia and to the rest of the world, corn and poultry. North-South flows because we include the Black Sea region on this, wheat, and then obviously food aid. The United States is number one in four of these categories. When you think about it, frankly, soybeans and corn, anybody notice how those two crops have basically taken over U.S. agriculture in the last 10 years? Absolutely amazing. That means the entire world, its excess capacity depends not only on weather, but on the health of agriculture in the United States. The most important source of stability in the system right now is basically U.S. agriculture. Only about 10 to 15 percent of food crosses borders today. That's going to rise dramatically because people are tapped out in terms of what they can produce. Let me show you why. Food is basically water turned into human energy in a more transportable mode. Moving water, very expensive, hard, you lose a lot of it. Moving food, much more sensible. Let's look at where there is world population versus similar percentage of world fresh water. So we look at Europe, and it's surprisingly not so good. We look at Africa, and it's surprisingly good. The problem is it only rains twice a year. <laughs> we look at Oceania, and you realize why New Zealand's the Saudi Arabia of milk. Compared to population, they got five times as much water as they need. Here's the problem. Asia is where all the rise is. The bulk of the population, barely a third of the water. And they have a tendency to go for very water-intensive crops, ironically. And then they, here's the hidden strength of the Western Hemisphere. Three times as much water as population. So guess who has excess grain? for export. Everybody grows grain. I'm talking about who's got extra. Four sources. Australia, New Zealand, Black Sea, ABC over here, and then the King Kong of the system. The OPEC of grains. <laughs> you talk about them having us over an oil barrel. We got them over a bread basket. Guess who barks first? Everybody else imports. So when they want more food, meat, that depends on the consumption of grains, guess who sees their bread prices rise 100% in the 12 months up to the Arab Spring. The biggest cause of the Arab Spring, I would argue, is the stress put on that system. The biggest proximate trigger, ultimately it's about much larger concepts. But we're talking a part of the world that imports 80% of its food and where 80% of household income goes to food. So you mess with the price of bread in the Middle East, North Africa, read your Victor Hugo. Climate change on top of that really makes everything more extreme. Where we can grow now, just draw lines at 35 north and south, 
Not a problem. But notice that the bulk of the extra land is to the north, not so much land down here in the south. And where we can't grow enough food now, it's going to get dramatically worse, primarily in the form of droughts. That's where the population growth is, where the water stresses already are. If you remember my non-integrated gap, that's overwhelmingly what it is. So what this is going to do is change our perspective. Climate change is going to be profound in Central and the North part of South America. That's going to continue to drive the movement of people, vegetation, and animals. We've seen vegetation and animals go northward or southward, poleward basically, and up in elevation consistently year after year after year. So you can argue about scientists lying to you and all that other crap, but plants and animals don't care. They're responding to the environment, and it's undeniable. Big surprise, people also feel that pressure. Why should they come north? Very solid reasons. Simplest. Here's where we grow wheat now, successfully. Biggest wheat exporter in the world. This is where we grow wheat middle of the century. That's a huge advantage. So historically, you read your Bjorn Lomborg. Humans love it when it gets hotter. We have problems when it gets colder, historically. So global climate change, if it makes the planet warmer, by and large, it's adaptability. It is a major extinction period for species. But humans, true to their nature, do better. Great book on the subject, Lawrence Smith, The World in 2050. It's really all about this concept of the New North as he describes it. All that arable land, all that uninhabited land, and a shifting of power to the north. Key entity here is the Arctic Council, dimly understood, poorly appreciated, not tracked by really anybody. And it was until, I think, Hillary's last year as Secretary of State that we finally had a Secretary of State go to one of these meetings to show it was important. Here are the eight players. And when you look at them, you say, my god, these are all a bunch of great countries. And Russia. <laughs> They're all also heavy drinkers, which I find interesting. <laughs> I've only blacked out from alcohol, really blacked out two times in my life, and both times Russians were involved. <laughs> so I have two rules in this world. I don't drink anything that doesn't come with a label. And I don't drink with Russians. <laughs> the New North, who's not here? The Chinese. Some interesting signs of their interest. They just built the biggest embassy the world's ever seen in Finland. Why? Finland's so crucial to the future of China? Well, apparently it is. A Chinese businessmen tried to buy 3% of Iceland recently. The government said no. He said he wanted a nature preserve. But who tries to buy 3% of a country? <laughs> the Chinese could always replace the Danes and sponsor Greenland's independence. I mean, the Danish flag is up there. Why couldn't the Chinese ones step in? You'll say, how crass. They just buy their way onto the seat? Well, they could buy their way onto the seat by buying access through the Russians. You'll say, I don't believe it. Never going to happen. I'll point out the United States bought its seat in the late 1870s for $7 million, one of the best purchases ever. So yeah. It can happen. But again, that longitudinal perspective giving way, yielding to an increasing latitudinal perspective. Where I see three conflict areas in this process. First, the northern sea route with the Russians. The Russians, much like the Chinese in the South China Sea, are already claiming way too much. They're fortifying militarily way too much. And the US has one, I think, nuclear power Coast Guard icebreaker to the Russians 10 or 12. 
So that's sort of a carrier number for the 21st century. We're expecting the Russians to make it prohibitively expensive. Because that's how the Russians interact with the world. Second big area, all the stress put on the system. You look at the blue parts. You see a concentration over here in the Indian Ocean where there's a lot of nuclear weapons. And you say, I'm concerned about that. And then third point, let's look at Africa, which is experiencing explosive growth, but only in certain areas. 80% of African borders are weirdly drawn according to longitude and latitude, have no reference to the underlying vegetation or uh, geography or tribal areas. It's as if somebody just took a ruler to a map and drew lines, which is because somebody just took a ruler to a map and drew lines. Here's the line that nature creates, and it corresponds to underlying social economic realities. It's brown versus green Africa. Predominantly Muslim North, herders. Predominantly Christian South, farmers. And guess what? Despite what Rogers and Hammerstein predicted, cowboy and a farmer never been friends. <laughs> Look at the countries that have experienced tumult. They're all on that fault line, so-called 10th parallel. Now let's shift to demographics. Talked about.